start soon. Okay. Um, the recording is on. Good morning and welcome everyone to this class, BC209 on holiness. We, um, this is the first time we are doing a course on uh, holiness. So uh, uh, it's going to be interesting and we're also going to be um, learning together uh, as we go through this course and I'll uh, introduce the course after we uh, pray together. All right, could I uh, please request somebody to uh, lead us in prayer and then we will get started. Could somebody pray with us please? All right. Any All right. Can we pray? Okay, Charles, go ahead. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful morning here in Africa. We thank you uh, that it's, I think, still the morning in India and you've connected us. We thank you for the ability of this, bringing the world together in such a spectacular way. Mm. And for the first time, to have such a training, you saw it fit for us that we would have it. Now, Lord, that you have allowed us to be here, mm. teach us. We are expectant and we can't wait hearing what you have prepared for us as we journey through this uh, semester, this course, that Lord Jesus, you will um, anoint our teacher and also anoint us that he will use the right vocabulary, he will use the best methods, but also will be able to retain and put in application what mm -hmm. we will have studied. For the glory of your name and for our good, in Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right. Good morning once again. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm just going to... Uh, introduce this course, uh, BC209 on holiness. Um, now, uh, I, I mentioned this on uh, Monday in our welcome uh, uh, orientation day. Uh, by the way, uh, just a side note, uh, Maxin and uh, Divya, uh, you had mentioned about the... Uh, Covenant's Cross and Blood course on spring 2021. So I went back to the archives and uh, it was my mistake. Uh, I did not turn the this course back to the students. So I had left it like that. You know, so it's, it's automatically graded, but I'm supposed to manually send this course back to the students, which I didn't do and I forgot. So I have asked uh, Monica, who is our teaching assistant, just to do that for us and I'm sure she'll do it sometime this week. So those numbers will come to you. The scores for that course will come to you. It's automatically graded, but it has to be manually sent back to the students. So you should get it. She should be able to do it this week and uh, you'll get it. But thanks for bringing it up because I completely forgot about it. Um, all right. So uh, back to this a course on holiness. Um, it's the first time we are doing this subject, uh, this course on holiness. And uh, uh, the, the idea was actually sparked um, maybe I'm thinking two or three years ago when uh, we, I was actually attending a leaders conference. It was, it was mainly pastors and uh, their leaders, people who are serving with them in their various churches across different parts in India. Uh, and uh, so we had this open time of discussion, question answers, uh, you know, so they were asking questions. And um, I think the topic that was given to me to speak was uh, holiness, I think. That was the topic. So I, I spoke on it and then there was the QA time. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the question answer time, uh, one of the leaders asked, you know, said, okay, how do I overcome temptation? And so uh, 
it it really struck me at that time you know that uh, uh, here we are as pastors and uh, leaders who are actually leading congregations and churches and serving people. And, um, and, and uh, you know, here, a very basic question, how do I overcome temptation? So then that's when, you know, it sparked my thought that, hey, I need to, we need to do something uh, to make sure that at least our Bible college students know how to overcome temptation. <laughs> that they shouldn't find themselves in a place like that where they are, you know, leaders of churches and congregations and they don't know how to live holy and, uh, you know, uh, this whole aspect of holiness and living and overcoming life. So that's what sparked this whole thought about this, having a course on holiness. And uh, so then we came and I came back and I just was thinking through on how to make it happen. And so we introduced the course. Uh, we, we thought about this course. Uh, let me uh, just share with you what we're going to cover in this course. Uh, uh, we have uh, put out the PDF there so you will be able to get it. So in this course on holiness, our, our objective, our whole approach to this course is, first of all, to get a vision or an understanding of the holiness of God, right? Uh, in as much as God is loving, God is compassionate, God is good, God is powerful, we must also get a revelation of the holiness of God. So that's the first part that we're going to, first section that we're going to deal or uh, talk about. And, um, you know, to the best we can, because, uh, you know, our words may not be fully our words will not be able to uh, communicate or our minds will not be able to fully understand, you know, the depth and the, 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 the width of, of God's holiness. But to whatever extent we can, we want to get a revelation of that through the scriptures, of course. And then after we understand about the holiness of God, uh, in that we also want to emphasize that ultimately God wants his nature to be reproduced in us, which means... He wants his holiness to be reproduced in us. So that's dealt with in section one on the holiness of God. And our worship of God must take place in the realm of the beauty of holiness. Right? So we want to talk about that. Then in section two, um, we want to talk about another very important aspect of uh, living a holy life, which is repentance. And uh, the reason we are dealing with this whole aspect of repentance is because perhaps in the church, uh, especially in the modern church, the contemporary church, not much is spoken about repentance. You know, I know in the traditional Pentecostal churches, repentance is like, you probably hear it every Sunday. <laughs> Uh, but in some of the contemporary modern churches um, that uh, emphasize a lot on the goodness of God and on his love and mercy, which is all important, perhaps we are not talking about repentance and the importance of repentance and the power of repentance in the life of a believer. In fact, it's almost like Repentance is not needed in the life of, a, of the believer. You know, it's kind of moved to that, uh, swung to that extreme. So we need to bring that back and, uh, you know, and, 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 and understand uh, what repentance is and how important it is uh, in the daily life or in the life of the believer, the day-to-day -day life. And then, so we spend a little bit of time on that. And then in section three, is where we deal with the, how do we live an overcoming life? You know, basically to answer that question, how do I overcome temptation? So I know God is holy. He wants his holiness to reproduce in me. I understand the, the role that repentance plays in my journey towards holiness. Uh, uh, and if, 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 if repentance is not there, it's almost like a roadblock uh, towards of a progression into holiness. But then there is this side, which is 
what God has given to us to live victorious, to live the overcoming life and walk in holiness. So we want to uh, just get into the practical side of that, uh, you know, understand how temptation comes, how deception comes, and then how we overcome the flesh, the world, and the devil. So uh, that's basic, uh, you know, uh, an overview of what we're going to cover in this course on holiness. Focus on the holiness of God, uh, a section on repentance, and then a section on living the overcoming life. And, uh, you know, and uh, I want to remain open uh, as, as, you know, as uh, students ask questions um, and maybe raise up some questions. You know, we may, f you know, may add those, uh, those aspects into the course um, as we go along. Uh, is everything clear so far? Any questions? Uh, we all know what we are going to do in this course. We are with you, Pastor. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, I, I, I hope you know this will be a good journey for all of us. Uh, you know, it's something we are doing for the first time, but uh, it's also a learning, a learning thing uh, for all of us. Yeah. Now, um, uh, uh, so for each of the sections, I will provide you the course notes. Basically, it's a study in scripture on these three aspects, uh, and um, I will, you know, there are some books out there, not some books, but many books out there on holiness and uh, uh, repentance and so on. So repentance itself is a big doctrine. So there are theological books on it. Uh, I, I might just share a couple of them with you uh, on the on the classwork section, maybe. Uh, I, I don't want to dump everything on you. Just pick pick a couple of them that uh, might be useful to read, uh, and I will give them to you. Uh, under, uh, these are books by other authors that you could, uh, if you have time, uh, it's good to read, uh, just to get you know get a perspective uh, on on this whole area of holiness, and uh, you know for us as especially for us as Christian ministers or people are preparing to serve God in some way, um, holiness is very crucial, very important. Uh, uh, while we recognize that we are only earthen vessels uh, and it's the grace of God and the work of the Holy Spirit, yet at the same time, as we will see in our journey through the scriptures, you know, God has called us to this place of holiness. So it's it's non-negotiable. It's not like, okay, an optional thing, you know. Uh, it's not an optional thing, uh, living a life of holiness. Uh, and so uh, that, that will become clear to us as we go through scripture. So let's get started. And uh, as always, feel free to ask questions and bring up points for discussion because uh, that will be useful. And it's also, uh, it'll also help us uh, and help us think through on areas we may be missing out uh, in, in this course. So we've put out the PDF there for the section and uh, you know, uh, I'd encourage you to download that and follow. So in this section on holiness, what we will start off with is first we'll focus on God himself, on the holiness of God, trying to, from scripture, trying to get some understanding, what is this holiness aspect of God? Right? So chapters one and two focus on that. Then uh, we slowly transition from the revelation of God's holiness to seeing his holiness reproduced in us. So we see in scripture that God wants his holiness in us. And he calls us not just to a little bit of holiness, he calls us to a place where Holiness is perfected in us. That means it's fully, um, it fully occupies us, right? So he calls us to perfect holiness. Uh, how, how has God set that up for us? Look at it. And then here's why. Why is it important? You know, the, it motivates us. Why should we pursue personal holiness. Uh, we talk about that. And then we leave us in chapter six with the fact that everything that we do 
should come out of this place of holiness. Right? We worship God in the beauty of holiness. And everything else, uh, you know, the work we do as volunteers, so we're called as volunteers uh, or ministers of God. Everything we do as ministers of God should really flow out of this place of holiness. So we leave us with that thought here in this section. Then we will move into the section on repentance, which I will give you another set of notes. Uh, and then we will get into the last section of overcoming. How do we personally live overcoming lives? So let's get started. Now, in this introduction, you know, um, uh, we're just going to make statements here that kind of, uh, you know, gets our thinking started uh, here about the holiness of God. So the Bible, in the Bible, both the Old and the New Testaments, God says he is holy. And his holiness is his nature. I mean, that's who he is, right? It's the very nature of God. And a thought I want us to think about is, and we will find this in scripture, that God's beauty is referred to as holiness. So, I mean, if you want to think about it in natural terms, you know, you look at the handsomeness of a man or the beauty of a woman, and, you know, it may be expressed in their appearance, whatever way. So just translate that to God, that God's beauty, meaning the aspect of God that should actually attract us to him, and the aspect of God that should make us stand in wow of him, is his holiness. I mean, just like when you see a very handsome person, so wow, that guy looks great, or that person, woman looks so pretty. I mean, it's just a wow thing. But now look at God. The beauty of God is his holiness. That means the holiness of God should make us stand, should first of all attract or draw us to him and also uh, make us, you know, feel uh, in awe of, wow, this is God. Right? The beauty of God is His holiness. Now, when we talk about holiness in the sense of who God is, it's His very nature. Uh, it's His absolute perfection, which includes, you know, just absolutely pure, uh, sinless, righteous, truthful, faithful. Now, God himself is the standard for holiness. That means, you know, uh, there's no other standard that, you know, he is perfection. And, uh, what we are trying to do to the best we can is to get a revelation of this, of the holiness of God and do whatever we can. I'm not saying we're going to be able to comprehend it or explain it, but to the best we can from scripture, we're going to try to get a revelation of this perfection of God. The other point we will emphasize is that Holiness is at the very core of God's nature, which means every attribute of the nature of God is mingled with holiness. And we must never see any attribute of God apart from holiness. That means we know God is love. Yes, God is love. But his love is mingled with holiness. We know God is a good God. 
but his goodness is mingled with holiness. You know, God is a generous God, a bountiful God, but his generosity is mingled with holiness. What does that mean? It means that in his goodness or in his love or in his generosity, he will never do anything that violates his holiness. He will never do anything. That's very important. Because sometimes we tend in our the way in our thinking and sometimes even in our preaching and teaching, we tend to present the goodness of God or the love of God or the generosity of God or any other attribute of God. We tend to present it or we tend to think about it outside of his holiness. Like you know, we don't always think that hey. Holiness is at the core of his nature, and every attribute of God is actually undergirded by holiness. And so sometimes the danger in separating that is we think, oh, God will be generous to me even if I want to do something wrong. He cannot. Or God will be good to me when I want to do something wrong. No, because every attribute of God is undergirded, is mingled, and it's governed by the holiness of God. Because holiness is at the core of his nature. God is holy. Okay. The third, uh, another aspect that we're going to discover, and, and this is just an introduction, so I'm just giving us an overview of what we're going to be covering, is that Only when we get a correct revelation of who he is, can we respond correctly to him. Right? So our revelation of God will determine our response toward God. Or our picture of God will determine our posture before God. If we don't get a revelation of the, of, the, of the holiness of God, then our response towards God or our posture before God will not be one of reverence. Or maybe I should put it in a positive way. When we get a revelation of the holiness of God, then our response toward God will be one of reverence. Because holiness, the holiness of God, it just makes us stand in awe of God and just causes us to be reverential towards God. But when we don't get it, when we don't have that revelation of the holiness of God and how great He is, then our response is diluted. You know, we, we understand about his goodness. We understand about his love. Uh, we understand about his power. Uh, we understand about, you know, uh, his provisions. All these things are good. We need a revelation of all of these uh, aspects or attributes of God. And therefore, we respond correctly towards God. But we must also have a revelation of the holiness of God, so that our response towards him can be one of awe and reverence. And also, our revelation of the nature of God will draw us to a place where we allow his nature to be reproduced in us. And of course, when it is reproduced in us, it will be revealed through us. Other people will see it. So that's why having a revelation of the holiness of God is so important because it determines our response 
uh, it will then determine whether we will come to this place of welcoming that aspect of his nature to be reproduced in us and therefore can be revealed through us. Other people will see that we are a holy nation. We are a people who live in holiness. But it all starts with this revelation. A connecting part is that everything about God is holy. You know, and as we will see, you know, when, when the angelic beings worship, they say, holy, holy, holy. That means completely holy, thrice holy. And it means, therefore, that everything about God is holy. His name is holy. He speaks in holiness, he dwells in holiness. And therefore, everything about his creation that is aligned to him must be holy. He dwells in holiness. So holiness is the standard for all of his creation. And everything that does not align to that standard of holiness is evil. It doesn't fit in his presence. And he must be hallowed because he's so perfectly holy. Or he must be reverenced, we could say. He must be feared and honored because he's so perfectly holy. Then we will learn that God calls us, he invites us to partake of his nature, which is to partake of his holiness. You know, the Bible says, God is love. We are supposed to walk in love. God is merciful. We are to be merciful. God is holy. We are to be holy means holiness is basically God's nature reproduced and revealed in us. So holiness is not about me trying to somehow come up to the level of God, which is impossible, of course. But holiness is me yielding myself to God so that his nature can be reproduced in me, revealed through me. So it's more of a yielding to who he is. So that he is, his nature is reproduced in us and revealed through us. So we become holy because he sanctifies us. So here's the other thought. So holiness as we understand it, it simply means to be set apart. It just means to be set apart. So what God is really doing, invoking his holiness in us is bringing us to this place where all of our, our being is set apart for him. And he imparts this to us. He not only gives us his nature, but he also empowers us to be in this place or this state or move into this place of being set apart. Because in this world, it's not easy because there is the pull of the world, of course, there's the pull of temptation that, that's actually pulling us away from being set apart to God. Temptations are there, the world has its attractions and the devil comes and puts out his arguments and etc., etc. So there's the pull of, why do you wanna be set apart for God? Come on this side. But when God is working in us, he not only imparts his nature, 
which is holiness, but he imparts to us the state of being holy. That means the ability to move into this place of being set apart for God. He gives that to us and we will see how he wants to impart that to us. And that's what overcoming life is about, learning how to receive that grace, that empowering. Pastor, Pastor, say that again, say that again of imparting his holiness. I, I didn't hear it too well. Okay. So I, I was just trying to explain this statement. So, okay, let me back up. So holiness. What does it mean? It means to be set apart. I'm talking about from our perspective, right? From our perspective, what does holiness mean? It means to be set apart for God. How does God do this in us? He, like we have been saying before, He imparts the quality of holiness. That means the nature, His nature. He imparts that to us. But he not only imparts the nature of holiness to us, the quality of holiness or the partaking of his nature, but he also empowers us to be set apart, to come into this so to the state of being holy, which is being set apart. He empowers us for that. So like I was saying, we all feel the pull of the world. That means there is, you know, there is the opposing force, so to speak, the attraction of the world. The world is pulling us, temptations are pulling us, uh, all kinds of influences are trying to corrupt us and say, why you want to be set apart? You come on the side. So that's where, as people, we struggle, right? And even ministers of God struggle because there's the, the pull of the world. But what we must understand in our learning to live holy is that God gives to us his nature, which is holy or holiness. And he gives us the empowering to be set apart or to be in the state of being holy. And he does that to us by his word, by his spirit, and through divine discipline. We will learn about that. Okay. But he gives us that. Is it clear, Charles? Yeah, it's coming. It's coming. Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> okay. It's coming. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. We just think about these things. Okay. Let it just. Just think about it, it'll, slow, it'll come, right? So, so for us, now we're talking about from our perspective, okay? From our perspective, to live holy or to being holy, and we're going to emphasize all these things. I'm just, we're just in the introduction now. It's kind of an overview. is really we embrace the fact that we are completely His. We are set apart, right? That means I'm completely His. And if we really embrace that fact, then the spontaneous result is living holy. So in everyday life, when we face the pull of the world, when we face the temptations that the devil throws, when we face you know, the lies and the deceptions of the enemy, he's trying to move us out of this place of being holy. You now he wants to move us out of this place of being set apart for God. And so, of course, you know, the, the pull of the world is there, the temptations of the enemy are there. But when we embrace the fact that I'm completely his, then the pull of the world 
and the temptations, the power of the, temp the, the temptations that come against us have automatically lost their power. Because what we have done is embrace the fact that we belong to him. Okay. So, holiness for us, I'm talking about from our human perspective, is us embracing the fact that I completely belong to God. Every part of me belongs to God. Right. So, when I recognize and I celebrate that, that all of me belongs to Him, the Most Holy One, then His holiness is reproduced and revealed in me. So, uh, I, I, I purposely put recognize and celebrate. It's, it's, holiness is not uh, a burdensome thing. You know, the traditional... And I and I and I you know I, I use the word Pentecostal because uh, you know in, in traditional Pentecostal approach it's like uh, holiness becomes a very regimented uh, enforced kind of thing you know you only have to wear white and you only have to sit like this and you only have to eat like this you can't go to the movies you can't do this you can't do that and it just becomes so burdensome so holiness a life of holiness is something people dread. But I want us to come to a place where we recognize holiness is something to be celebrated. It's not to be dreaded. It's not to be, it's not a burdensome thing. It's a celebration that I just belong to God. I just belong, hey, all of me belongs to the most holy one. So sin, evil has no place in this thing. So a life of holiness uh, is a recognition and a celebration. It's not a burdensome thing. It's not a, you know, oh no, I've got to live holy. No, it's like, God, thank you. I can be yours. I can belong to the most holy one. I can be set apart for the most holy one. And when we come from that place, um, cleansing, Sanctification and consecration of every part of us comes spontaneous. So our desires, our affections, our passions, and just every other part of us, you know, our dreams, our hopes, our mind, our body, our thoughts, words, deeds, everything, everything about us is simply about being hallowed unto him, set apart for him, uh, uh, keeping it honoring to the one who is the most holy one. So it becomes a celebration of God himself. Now, I know it's easy, easily stated, but in... Uh, practice, as we will see in our last section on living the overcoming life, it is a process. It is a process. And uh, as uh, Peter puts it, you know, in First Peter 4, he says, we are striving against sin. So there is a, there is a striving against sin. And sometimes for some people it is quite challenging, right? So it's this process, happens step by step, but God works by his word, his spirit and divine discipline, and he makes us a holy people to our God. So that is, you know, the second and third sections when we talk about repentance and we talk about overcoming, uh, you know, um, we understand God is at work uh, and it happens as a process where we become a holy people unto our God. And like we said, all ministry, all ministry, 
worship and everything else we do flows out of this place of holiness. It must take place in the beauty of holiness. And we will make some statements later on that if it does not take place in the beauty of holiness, it cannot be acceptable to God. Now that's a strong statement. All ministry must take place in the beauty of holiness. If it does not take place in the beauty of holiness, it cannot be acceptable to God because God is absolutely holy. And we will see scripture where he adorns his house with holiness. It's like, you know, you go to somebody's house and you see how they've decorated their house. You know, what they really like is what they'll really put up. You know, maybe they like um, uh, lots of colors and maybe so they put up lots of colors in their home. Maybe they like, um, you know, maybe some people like a lot of uh, handicrafts. And so you'll see a lot of handicrafts hanging around their home. Maybe some people like a lot of paintings and so they put up a lot of paintings. Maybe some people like a lot of plants, you know, garden things. And so you see a lot of things. But the Bible says God adorns his house with holiness. Now it's God, to, God is like, hey, my house is adorned with this holiness thing, this perfection. That's why we're saying every form of worship and service must take place in the beauty of holiness for it to be acceptable to God. Because God dwells in the beauty of holiness. Okay. So I'm just going to pause here. Let me see if there are any questions on the chat. Any, any questions here? Okay, let's see now. Charles uh, asked a question. So the attributes of God are all intertwined and none of them can be singly removed from him and he remains complete. Is it right? Yes, Charles. So all the attributes of God, uh, God is, you know, it's part of his nature, right? But what we were intentionally emphasizing is that every attribute of God that we speak about, you know, his love, his goodness, his power, his kindness or generosity or his mercy, every aspect is intertwined with holiness. So he will never exercise any of these attributes outside of holiness. That's kind of what we were emphasizing. Okay, Kennedy, I'm having difficulty getting class links. Um, Uh, having difficulty getting class links. Okay, is that okay, I Kennedy? I, 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 you got it now? Yeah, or? yeah since okay. yesterday, I even went to the admin, eh? but I'm not able to get the link. Actually, I'm being assisted by Tarun. Tarun is the one who sends me the links. Oh, oh, oh you, you're not getting it as an email, is it? Is not that the yet, problem? Not, no, no. That's the problem, yeah. Okay, so Kennedy, if you, um, if you connect to every classroom, uh, then what happens is your email ID is automatically registered as one of the students and then you get notifications. I'm not getting uh, the notification. Okay. So then the um, other thing I can think of is if you go to the, um, the menu on the, uh, on the right, uh, let me just show this. Uh, yeah, there's a settings there. Uh, let me just show it to you. So if you go towards here, the sandwich menu, and then you go down here to settings. So you click on settings and then you have to turn this on. You receive email notifications, right? So just check in your classroom settings if you've turned on receive email notifications. Uh, because if that's off, then you won't get the emails, right? So you have to go to class your classroom settings, go there and things. So that's the only other thing I can uh, think of. Uh, that uh, might uh, 
uh, maybe the reason why you're not getting it. Just have a look. I'll, I'll try. I'll, I'll check it. Okay. Okay. I'll check later. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next question from Christopher. Uh, please give us a few real life examples of setting us apart for God. Um, so in practical life, for example, suppose I'm sitting in a room where, you know, people are just saying all kinds of jokes. Now, there's nothing wrong in joking. There's nothing wrong in having fun, laughing. But suppose the jokes are bordering on being indecent, vulgar, you know, then I immediately, immediately disengage from that. Why? I'm just give an example. Because uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 4, Ephesians 5, 4 says, it's talking to us believers, and he's saying, neither foolish, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting. Now, that's old English word. I mean, old English words, I'm reading from the New King James. Uh, it says, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. Ephesians 5, verse 4. So, just one scripture here. It says, you know, don't engage in foolish talking or coarse jesting. That means this indecent fun. Don't engage. So at that moment, you say, you know what? I am set apart for God. And I do not want to partake in this. Now, the other people around you may be Christians, may be believers, and they don't mind making these kinds of jokes. But that moment, you say no. I'm set apart for God. I'm going to disengage. I'm not going to be a participant to this. What are you doing? You're setting yourself apart for God because you know God doesn't approve of it. And that's not right. And the scriptures are telling us as Christians, as believers, not to, it's not fitting for us. Right? So like this, there will be so many things, whether it's in the behavior, within the thought life, maybe a thought comes to you. In your mind, nobody else knows it, only you know it. It's in your mind. That moment you say, no, I'm not going to engage. I'm not going to fantasize. I'm not going to be part of it. Why? My whole being, including my thought, including the realm of my imagination, is set apart for God. It's holy. Right? So whether it's in thought, in word, in deed, we are setting ourselves apart for God. Is that okay, Christopher? Okay. Uh, let's just do the other questions. Um, Divya. Everything about God is holy, and also He is the beginning and the end. But if someone asks, how did evil come into being? How can one answer? So the question is, how did evil come? I mean, God is holy. Now, here is something to think about. God is holy. And he created beings. These were angelic beings. But each of these beings, the angelic beings and us, humans are created as free moral agents. He didn't create us as robots. That means he's given us the power of a free will. And what we understand uh, uh, from Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 is one angel sinned. He was one of the archangels, meaning high-ranking chief angels. What was his sin? It was a sin of pride. But how did pride come? Through self-deception. So, the first thing that opened the door to evil was self-deception. So how do you know it? In Isaiah 14, if you read it carefully, it says that this archangel, Lucifer, son of the morning, said, I will ascend. I will be like the Most High. 
right? So this is Isaiah 14, verse 13. For you have said in your heart, what was that? Self-deception. So the devil need, didn't, you know, Lucifer didn't need the devil to deceive him. There was no devil. But what happened? Self-deception. He said, I will, I will, I will. And I'm not reading all of that, but if you read Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13 and 14, that's what we see, right? What opened the door to evil self-deception? What was the first sin? Pride. And then everything happened. So the biggest thing we have to be careful about as believers is self-deception. Okay. Okay, we're already out of time. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. okay. And, uh, the scripture references was Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13 and 14. We're out of time. Let me see now. Okay, Beth. What exactly do you mean by the phrase in the beauty? When you talk about worship and service, needs to be in the beauty. Of course, we are all sinners. So we're talking about attitude. Um, so very quickly, uh, but, and we will get into this, Beth, in, in, the, in, the, in the chapter number six, right? We will get into the details of it. But very quickly, it should come from a posture and a place of holiness. That means my heart attitude must be reverential and must be in a place that recognizes God as holy, holy. That's the posture. The place is, I am set apart. I am living holy, right? So we were sinners. We are not sinners. We are saints. That means holy ones. The word saint simply means holy one. So God doesn't see you as a sinner. God sees you as hagios, a saint, a holy one. So that's your place. So from that place, from a posture and a place of holiness is where worship and ministry must come. Okay, that's in a nutshell. We will pick it up in chapter number six. We'll get into the details of it. Okay, uh, okay, 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 okay. All right, so one last question, Abhishek. How can sin enter into Lucifer's heart where there is no, uh, no sin? Yeah, so remember Abhishek, what we're saying is it is self-deception. That means you're deceiving your own self, right? So you don't need somebody else to do it. It's just basically it's the wrong thinking. We are thinking the Lucifer thought wrong, self-deceived. And that's what led to his uh, doing what he did. Okay, I'm going to stop now because uh, you need to have time to take a break and join the other class. Can somebody please say a two-sentence prayer and, uh, and close and dismiss us, please? We'll continue this next week. Okay. Yeah. I'm praying. Go ahead. Our Heavenly Father, we bless you this morning for this wonderful session that we have had with you. We continue to pray that, Lord, you keep us in the place of holiness mm -hmm. and cause us to reflect the beauty of your holiness mm -hmm. in all our ministry. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray and give you glory and thank you for an answered prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Elisha. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. Sorry for rushing off. Um, I've been asked what's your question? No, no question. Fine. Okay. God bless you all. See you again next week. Thank you. Bye now. I'm stopping.